Welcome to KJV Cafe. Thanks for taking time out of your day to listen. Each episode of the cafe is dedicated to studying the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Your host here at the cafe is Bible teacher Clark Covington. Looks like the coffee is hot and ready, so let's get started. Thank you for joining me. Welcome to the cafe. Welcome to the program. Pastor Clark Covington here with another episode of KJV Cafe. So glad you're here. It's such a blessing to be here as we go deeper here in Genesis 15 verse 1, a verse that probably really you could preach on it for a year and not exhaust it. You could study it for a year and not exhaust it. Uh, As we see here, um, a short verse, but a lot here, Genesis 15 1. After these things, what things? Well, that's when Abram had to go to war there take out the invaders and the kings, return the goods to Sodom, return Lot, his nephew, to Sodom, get blessed by Melchizedek, be affirmed by Melchizedek. That was the word I was looking for a few episodes ago, and it didn't come up, affirmed. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. There's just so much here. By the way, it says, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. I can't help but go to John chapter 1, verse 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That right there is Jesus Christ. And so, you you can't tell me in Genesis 15, 1, this isn't referring not just to God talking to Abraham, but Jesus himself speaking to him here. And Abram, of course, is his name in this. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. How awesome is that? Jesus speaking to Abram in a vision saying, what does he say? He says, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. We see here, fear not, God is the shield, the exceeding great reward. And you have those three points there. Obviously, these are the promises to God. Don't be afraid. I'll protect you and I'll reward you. A matter of fact, I am your reward, God speaking there. But before we get to those, and we're about there, I promise, but before we get to those, we look at this idea that God says, I am thy shield and exceeding great reward. It says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. What does that mean? That means this is a personal relationship, right? A personal relationship. This isn't a promise made from some far off God to some far off person. This is a promise made to Abram who is in the will of God. He is doing the will of God. We know that because, again, he was just affirmed by Melchizedek, who's a picture of Christ. And now we see after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram. That, I believe, is Jesus Christ himself coming unto Abram. He's affirmed by God. He is in the will of God. He has these promises because he is doing the will of God. And so today we're looking at this idea of, hey, you know what? I'm willing to do his will. What does that take? That's how we're going to tackle it today as soon as we come back from this break. So stay tuned. You're listening to KJV Cafe. We encourage you to look us up on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. Now let's get back to some more in-depth Bible study. All right. So there's a man who's got a hundred dollar bill and he walks up to a grown adult and says, you climb up these five steps and I'll give you this hundred dollars. And the man says, okay. And he looks at those steps and they were quite small. And he just jumps from the first to the top and said, I I climbed them. And the person with the reward said, no, you didn't. You jumped from the first to the fifth. You didn't do, you didn't do what I said. A child walks up, but the man says, climb up those five stairs and you'll get a hundred dollars. And the child says, okay, five stairs and climbs up one by one and gets to the top. And the child receives the reward. And the man says, what? I got up there faster. And the man with the reward said, I didn't ask you to go up faster. I asked you to go up these five steps. You see, that is what it's like living for God. We look at all kinds of shortcuts, all kinds of ideas we have on our own. But with a childlike faith to simply do what God calls us to ask, call. Okay, let me take that again. To do what God simply calls us to do and asks us to do. There you go. We're blessed. We're blessed with reward. Willing to do his will. What does it take? It's an honest desire to know the truth. That honesty of A childlike faith, like saying, God, I'm going to just take you at your word. I want to know your truth. Why would someone not have an honest desire to know the truth? They want to live in sin. A lot of smart people practice uh, scientific work, right? I don't always say it like they're in the trade, scientific trade. I don't know what it means. Look, a lot of 
smart people know math and science, okay? And there was a scientist that once said, I can't believe in God because if I did, then I have to change everything about my life. And what he was saying is this exact statement that people don't desire to know the truth because they want to live in sin. The Lord tackles this one when they hate the light because they love the darkness, right? It's like being a student, right? Going back to that idea of childlike faith and being studious. Bad students, what do they want? Look, I can tell you about a bad student because I was one. I was a very bad student. Um, yeah, I was like really not good. Okay. Bad students do not want to learn. And I can attest to that when I was young and in elementary, middle high school, I did not want to learn. I just, I don't know what I wanted to do, uh, but not learn. That wasn't on the list. What do they want to do? They look for pleasure, laughing, rebel, disrupt. And again, I'm just listening from experience when I was young and then good students. I knew a few of them. They're so opposite. Are they not? They're humble and they're meek. They're quiet when instructed. They're listeners. Good students are reachable and teachable. Being a teachable, a good student, you want to learn, right? Well, that's the same for God's will. Is that you today? Are you teachable? Are you, are, are you being a good student, quiet, eager, humble, wanting to learn? You know, the qualities of a good student, they're eager to learn. They're motivated. They're curious. Uh, there's one I know, uh, a niece of mine um, on my wife's side, I guess that would be my, my niece, and just a phenomenal student. And I think she embodies a lot of these qualities here. It's eager to learn, motivated, curious. God's okay with your questions. In fact, I believe he welcomes your questions. He's always welcomed mine. And guess what? He provides an answer. Sometimes I may not like the answer, but he's God, amen. He's object being objective. A good student's objective. They're not going into the classroom with a bias that won't let them see the truth. They're objective. They're persistent in finding the answers to tough questions. Are they not? A good student will hound you and hound you to get the right answer. I, for a season, was teaching uh, on the college level as an adjunct professor of public communication for some years at a public university. And, you know, stu the good students, they would hound you. They needed to know the answer. They needed clarity on the question. Whatever it was, a good student was persistent in finding the answers. A good student is innovative at researching using the tools at their fingertip, fingertips, whether it's phones or Bibles, study guides. A good student's obedient. They almost never miss class. And they're not tuning out all the time. A really good student, you know, the top of the class, they're tenacious. They're not readily relinquishing a position, principle, or course of action. They're determined, amen. Look at how Nicodemus approached learning about Jesus, John 3, 1 through 2. There was a, a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came by Jesus, came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. You see, he went by night. He, you know, if he wasn't interested, would he have gone by night? I'm telling you what, especially when you get older, you don't want to do anything, you know, at late at night. You're not going to go out. Look, in the summertime, it doesn't get dark till nine o'clock. At nine o'clock, I'm pretty much done for the day, amen. We're, we're, we're winding down over here in the Covington household, okay? I promise you that. And he went out by night. He said, look, you know, I mean, what? who is he? He's a, a man of the Pharisees, right? If he was caught, he probably would be in pretty deep trouble, amen? And yet he said, I've got to know. He came to Jesus by night. He said, Rabbi, which means master, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. By the way, John 3, that's leading up to that famous John 3, 16 verse. And we see he's desiring God. He has a hunger for God. You see what I'm getting at? Hopefully you see what I'm getting at. That these qualities of a good student, eager, curious, objective, persistent, innovative, obedient, tenacious, these qualities are what we are to apply to understanding who God is and living in his will. If you have the will to do his will, these are these qualities that we should then apply. Amen. All the more so that the devil will try to get you off track. The more you live for God, mark it down, the more the devil will battle you. That's why you need things like tenacity and obedience, persistence. And you're saying, well, if I want to live for God, why doesn't God just make a way? Well, he will make a way, but he wants you to give him your all. There was a message. I don't even know if I ever preached it, but I, I sent myself a note. All God wants is your all. I think I did. But either way, that's a truth that, that I I've come to know, amen, through my journey from being a camera guy at the church, amen, to uh, a, a deacon, to a, a youth preacher, to, to a, a uh, church planter, to a radio minister, 
and whatever else, I've come to know that all God wants is my all. Amen. And that when I give my all, I have the closest fellowship with him. That Nicodemus went by night. Amen. That you have to have devotion. You know, how silly is it that we can understand these principles for success in life? You see people apply these principles and they're just, they figure it out. In the corporate world, if you want to be like a boss, get a mentor, right? My wife told me that there was a guy that had had a lower position and now he was a boss at a big company and you read his story, he got a mentor, right? You understand this idea, like get a mentor and show up for work all the time, right? Work hard. You understand in sports. I love sports. You know, hey, practice, 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 practice. We had a coach who bought into the philosophy that practice should be way harder than the games for football and practices. They were really hard and they were really intense. And when we went out in the games, we mostly won. Amen. My senior year and my junior year, we, we won a lot because our practices were really hard because we devoted ourselves. We understood, or at least the coach understood, and he led us in this idea that if you want something bad, you have to devote yourself. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, a very celebrated individual, has the 10,000 hour rule from his book, Outliers, right? So you're spending roughly, you know, 10,000 hours to master a craft. 10,000 divided by 40 hours a week is 252 weeks or roughly five years of spending time to become a master at your craft. What if you read your Bible and studied your Bible for 40 hours a week for five years? (laughs) I know you may think I'm crazy, but what if, I mean, what if, how deep would your knowledge be of him and his word, you know? And I know some people out there maybe struggle with this and it's not, you know, I laugh, but it's actually a very serious matter. You know, I guess I laugh because everyone would think, who has time for that? Well, why not make time for that? You know, if you devote time to God, he'll reciprocate. Amen. How about the, there was a book called The Case for Christ, which turned into a movie. And the book is by Lee Strobel. He's a skeptic. He put his journalistic skills to work and he wanted to disprove Christ. He ends up getting saved. His life has dramatically changed. He ended up in the ministry. Uh, I have not read the book, but I saw the movie. I love the movie because it backs up this principle of as we objectively seek for the Lord. And he's not the only one. There's a great testimony out there of a feminist professor, you know, who was all into all of those things of the world that went out to disprove God. And she gets saved and ends up marrying a pastor and all these things, has a great testimony. Look, this is the principle that when we desire God, when we pursue God, when we say, God, you will be preeminent in our life as you've instructed us to make you, then, Lord, we will be close with you, that God will reveal himself to you. 2 Peter 3, 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. You see that people are willingly ignorant of God creating the earth, of God's power, of his sovereignty, of his will, of his ways. They're willfully ignorant. It gets in the way of their lifestyle, in the, uh, of their pet sin, of whatever other thing they have going on. And here's the point. They're doing that to their own detriment, right? To their own detriment. You know, if I say, I will not look at the law, I'm going to speed down this road as fast as I can. And then they come and give me a ticket. The state trooper pulls me over and gives me a ticket, which might be my brother-in-law. I have a brother-in-law as a state trooper, uh, in which case I give him a big smile and say, hey, brother-in-law. But either way, I say get pulled over. I go before the judge. I say, I've got this ticket. And the judge says, sir, the law is thus and such, and you have broken it. And I say, oh, I didn't look at the law. I didn't didn't read the law. I didn't do anything. I didn't didn't view it. So does the judge then let me off the hook? No. No. And you say, well, Brother Clark, we're not under the law. No, we're not. But who fulfilled the law? Christ. And so if I refuse to get to know Christ, am I any better off? If I say in word that I believe in Christ, but I really don't, am I better off? Amen. If I'm willfully ignorant to the ways of God, how can I be close to God? Amen. And so to grow close to God and to be in his will, we must earnestly seek him, make time for him and not be willfully ignorant. And when we do these things, we'll have a rich and loving relationship with God. I promise you that based upon his word. Tune in next time. Thank you for listening. Take care. God bless and amen. Thanks for spending time with us today at the cafe. We would love to hear from you. You can email Brother Clark directly at clark at enduringpromise.org. See you again tomorrow. 
Same time, same place.